Hey guys, it's Ray with Spray Wash. Hope everybody's doing great out there today. We're going to be talking a little bit about GFIs, GFCIs today. Now, that stands for either a ground fault interrupter or a ground fault circuit interrupter. Really and truly, the name is interchangeable. You'll see them just listed out different way, but ground fault interrupter or ground fault circuit interrupter. Typically speaking, that's going to be a plug that looks like this that's on the house somewhere. And that plug's job is whenever it gets wet, is it's got its own little breaker in here. It's not breaking at the panel box. It throws before it gets to the panel box. And whenever this gets too much moisture in there, it's going to pop it on one of these here. Now you might see a red light that shows up if it's popped. It may have a green light if it's on. Sometimes it doesn't have a light if it's on. A lot of the newer ones do have like a, a checking light to show you that it's on and it's working. Sometimes there won't be a light at all. It'll just be a button that pops out and the, the base of the button is red. But look around the house and these are the ground fault interrupters. Typically speaking, a ground fault interrupter is going to have to be around any places that have water, such as bathrooms, within six to eight foot of a kitchen sink and in all outdoor areas. Now, the plug itself might not have to be a GFI or a GFCI plug, but it's going to have to be protected by a GFCI plug. Meaning that if the hot and the cold are running into this plug, so this side's going, you know, the hot side, cold is coming out this side, whenever this button pops, it's stopping the whole flow of it. So this plug's going to blow, and everything downwind of this, down circuit of this plug is going to blow. So that's why whenever we pop a plug that might not be a GFCI, still most likely it's being protected by a GFCI. They can be wired in a series. Hold on, and I'll draw that on the board for you. All right, I've drawn a really, really basic floor plan here. So we've got a house. It's a two bedroom, one bath house. We've got a garage. It's going to be our living room. Here's our front door right here. Garage is a side entry. We've got a kitchen, living room, dining room in there. Out back, we've got a porch and a patio. And real important, here's our power pole at the street coming in to the main power box right here. This is going to be the main power box on this house. So areas, according to my state building code, and every state could be a little bit different, areas that are going to have to be projected by the ground fault interrupted are areas that could get wet, such as the kitchen, the porch, the patio, the bathroom, and a lot of times the garages will all need the protection of a GFI. Now, if this is not a real big house, if there's not a, a huge amp draw expected on this property, the GFIs can do multiple duties. It's not one plug per GFI. So I could have the wires coming in here from the kitchen for the panel box going into the kitchen. Okay, so this kitchen could then be wired into the bathroom over here. So if I pop, if somebody was working in, inside the kitchen and they popped this one, it could, in theory, make the controls in the bathroom go out. It could make this, the wall sockets in the bathroom trip. Same thing if the ones on the porch control the ones in the bathroom, those could go out because most likely I'm not pressure washing in the kitchen. So let's make a different example on that. But let's say that I've got outlets here on the porch and it's wired in a series through the walls there. I'm working on this outlet and this outlet and then it goes on through 
to the bathroom so there's an outlet there in the bathroom. So if I'm pressure washing out here, and let's say that I got water in this outlet, and it was a GFCI outlet. It was one of these with these two buttons on there. I tripped this one. What's going to happen then at this point, this GFCI might still be operating, but this one's going to be dead, and the one that goes into the bathroom is going to be dead. So you might not even have hit that plug with water, but another plug that you've hit on that property could wind up tripping and causing those other plugs to go offline, for lack of a better word. Now, one of the really tricky things about GFIs is these are designed to trip when they come into contact with water. They also have a lot lighter trip strength than a typical breaker does. These are meant to short out. These are meant to pop and stop electricity immediately. So whereas your, your typical, you know, breaker might be a 15, 20, 30 amp breaker inside of a house, this one's going to be 10 or 15, but it's got a lot lighter throw capacity. It's got a lot lighter tolerance for being tripped by water, by any kind of fluid. So therefore, it's going to trip a lot easier than, say, a regular breaker inside the house, because that's what it's designed to do. Uh, it's designed to keep people safe, and so things, somebody get, you don't get electrocuted out there. So they're just doing their job. Now, a couple of things you ought to learn about the GFIs, at least in Florida code, I think it's either six or eight foot from the panel box, there has to be a main GFI on there. I've seen a lot of times hidden GFIs in the garage or the, the first GFI that controls all the other GFIs might be or should be at least between six to eight foot on newer construction close to this panel box. I remember one particular house in, you know, one house in, in particular that it was really stopped us. We wound up having to get a an electrician out there uh, to find it. Let me see if I can do this from memory, but say this is the garage and so this is the garage door coming in here. The panel box was like here on the house. There was a laundry room right here and then the kitchen came off the laundry room. Well, there was a Murphy ironing board. If anyone knows what a Murphy ironing board is, it's one that fold, it's a built-in ironing board that folds up into the wall. So, you know, you'd have a little cabinet right in there, and then you'd open the door up, and the Murphy ironing board would fold down as a space-saving apparatus. Well, the GFI, so here was the main panel box, and we knew the main GFI had to be within six to eight foot of that. The main GFI was under this ironing board right there. So here in the laundry room, in front of this panel box that was on the garage wall, was this Murphy ironing board. I went around the house, I reset every outlet that I found. I moved stuff out of the garage to see if there was everything hidden. In the garage there wasn't the electrician kind of laughed whenever I told him where the house was he went over there took him like two minutes to go in there click push the switch and we were back in business because he knew a lot of those houses over there how they were designed and the problem of those GFIs out there all right so right now I've drawn out you know a rough panel box here and four plugs in a row to help you know, emphasize this point some. So on this, this is the GFI. This is the plug that's actually the GFI protected plug right here. This plug has no GFI protection on it because we've got hot wire, common wire going this way. So then off of that, the GFI is here. If we were to pop this GFI right here, so what's going to happen is this plug and this plug that are further downstream, they're going to go offline should the GFI get popped. 
Also, the GFI itself is going to go offline. Now, here's what's really important to understand. Here's where a lot of people hurt themselves and why you don't play around with electricity yourself. The wires going to the GFI, they're still hot. So if you were to say, oh my gosh, I've got a problem with the GFI, it's off, let me pull this out and replace it myself unless you go back to the circuit box and turn that breaker off, you're going to get the snot shocked out of you whenever you start messing with this plug. Because even though you've shut the power off to that plug because this little button right here popped off, you've still got power going to that plug. It's just this little button right here is not allowing the plug itself to work, but the plug's still hot. But this reason right here is why so many times we'll trip an outlet somewhere um, or an outlet won't work in an area that we've not even been washing because they can be wired in a series like this. And as I showed before, you could have a GFI in the garage controlling something in the kitchen. You could have a GFI in the bathroom controlling something on the patio. Furthermore, if you wind up causing a disturbance in the line like a short, you could have technically multiple GFIs on the same line. It could wind up blowing all of them. It could kind of just put the whole system and go ka-chunk. If it's on that same circuit, it could cause issues to every GFI that's on that line. So something to really consider. You also always have to worry about who in the heck wired this house? Has there been some hairy homeowner repairs that were not done by a licensed certified electrician? We see that a lot too with additions and remodels and wiring codes changing out there. Another thing to look at as far as GFIs are concerned is we will see GFIs themselves directly on the box themselves. Sometimes the individual breakers will have GFIs on there. You can usually see them. They'll look different than the, than the rest of the breakers. And there might be a little red window or a little test trip switch on the breakers themselves. Um, let me try to draw one out here. Let's say that you know, here's a sideways view of the breaker and it's got the big flip switch right here. And it may say push to reset. There might be a little button in there. That's typically what an in-the-box GFI would look like. I've even seen those worked in, in concession with these, where you may have these down the line, and then a larger GFI in the box itself. It's all going to depend on your building codes, how many repairs have been done on that house, who's done those repairs. A lot of things to consider on that. Something else about these, dirty little secret, is this is one of those pieces that's actually designed to wear out. Back whenever I sold real estate two decades ago, one of the biggest things on home inspections was replacing GFIs. There would be GFIs that whenever they were tripped, they would never reset. And it was just a, a perfect example of a 20-year-old GFI that had never gotten popped, but once you popped it to check and make sure it was working, it would not reset itself. You could never get it to reset. And the home inspector would say, GFIs need to be replaced. Now, a really good, cheap $5 piece of insurance you can get yourself is a tester like this. You plug this in to the socket, and what's going to happen is it'll light up and show you if the plug is, one, working, and two, by the light sequence, it's going to show you if it's wired correctly. One of the things that we like to do at Spray Wash is we'll go around to every plug before we tape them, 
and make sure the plug is working. And then when we go around and untape the plugs on the outside, we plug it back in to make sure that we haven't tripped anything, to make sure that we haven't possibly tripped a plug that could be controlling a freezer full of meat, that could be controlling the plug in the kitchen that's going to make the coffee maker tomorrow. And understand, whenever people have a beer fridge in, the, in their, their, their garage, or they have a chest freezer in their garage, it's not something that they go and check every day. It's also important that whenever you're pressure washing a house, to check them whenever you're done. And at minimum, let the people know, hey, check any appliances you have. If you have a freezer in the garage, Go check it and let's just make sure that it's working because we've made every effort we can to ensure the safety of all the electrical devices on there. But, you know, we'd still like to check it because we don't want there to be a problem. So this can be an absolute lifesaver whenever it comes to checking the devices to make sure that you haven't tripped anything at the very end. It could also be important so you're not getting played by a customer who says, oh, well, you shorted out a plug. Well, do you really know if that plug was working before you started or not? This will give you an idea if it was working or not. And then you take a picture of that um, and document it for your house wash. But these are real simple, these little, you know, Circuit testers right here, just plugs in some of the cheapest insurance that you will ever get. Now, at our plant and property protection class, we get into this really in detail. You know, how to tape and how you tape is just as important as taping because I've seen tape that, frankly, it's useless. I mean, you're wasting your time on some of the tape jobs that we've seen out there. Uh, they're not really keeping water to go in. We talk about the difference between waterproof and water resistant. And, you know, the boxes like this, we have a whole series on, on the, the plant and property protection class. You know, why, how to tape a box like this. Should you tape a box like this? I know there's a lot of people in the industry out there and we see that, you know, guys all the time going, oh, well, it's not our responsibility. It, it's not my responsibility because because they're supposed to be waterproof. And if I get water in there, you know, it's not my fault. It's your fault. It's your fault because one, you're not spraying water on the plug. You're not spraying weather on the plug. Typically speaking, you're, play, you're spraying a salt water solution at pressure onto that customer's plug. And the salt water makes this makes water more conductive and it makes the water more corrosive and it might be going in there at more pressure than rain or weather will ever be going into that plug. But these are the little things that we can do to make sure our customer has the absolute best pressure washing experience in the world. But we'd love to see you at the plant and property protection class. We've got one coming up in Atlanta, Georgia at the huge convention, August 18th. Go to plantandpropertyprotection.com or you can find that course online. Hey guys, I'm Ray with Spray Wash Academy and Spray Wash Pro. Wash on. I also want to give a big, big, big disclaimer on there. I am not a licensed electrician. Probably 99% of the people that you talk to online aren't elect licensed electricians, okay? I can give you this advice, I can give you this information, but do not take this as the gospel. Make sure you verify this information. And the other thing too, I really encourage you to not do these repairs yourself. Please don't do these repairs yourself. Hire someone to do it. Get that bit of liability off your back. We see in the groups all the time more and more pictures of people, of, of washers posting of damage that's happened to houses. We've seen fires that have happened. We've seen houses that have practically burnt down right after a pressure washing job. And I'm not trying to scare you, but absolutely seek expert advice on there. 